The Pope's pilgrimage of penance takes him to Quebec City. Each appearance, an opportunity for reconciliation. Is the message hitting the mark? I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, thousands flock to see and be seen. Today, and today I'm coming here for my mother. The Pope asks again for forgiveness for the wrongs committed by Catholics in residential schools. Plus, we're working for our survival. Why a group of people walked for days to be here. I want to let go of this anger of what happened to my nation, to those children, to my father. And I'm Neil Kirksal. Another development tonight as Canada's national sport is forced to confront its culture. There needs to be new leadership within Hockey Canada. Will you do that? Will you step down? There are new details about just how many times Hockey Canada settled sexual misconduct claims. And... It's like the walls are keeping in. A Canadian pop superstar takes a break from the stage. It just struck me as so courageous. Why Sean Mendez is canceling his tour. This is The National. Tonight, we bring you The National from Quebec City and the historic Plains of Abraham, now the site of another landmark event in this country's continuing story. The Pope arrived here today on the second leg of this six-day pilgrimage of penance. Que hacen que el paisaje canadiense sea único y colorido. And once again, Pope Francis asked for forgiveness for the sins committed at church-run residential schools. He gave his official apology on Monday in Alberta, now alongside Governor General Mary Simon and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau inside the Citadel. He addressed a crowd of thousands through closed-circuit TV. And some had walked for days just to get here. At this crucial moment for Indigenous people in Canada, emotions are running high and reactions cover a very wide range. Thomas Daigle shows us how the Pope was received here today and what some are hearing in his message. For the Pope, it's only a short drive from the airport to the heart of Quebec City. But with crowds gathering on the storied Plains of Abraham, many traveled for hours and waited generations each coming with their own hope for what they would see and feel. It means so much to me to actually, uh, um, I, I, guess, I guess, feel feel the apology instead of just hearing it. Kenneth Gilpin was taken from his family on the Cree Nation of East Maine at age eight. Those who never returned home weigh on his mind here and always. To be loved, it's not there, you know, that's... Uh, that was taken away from us. On a trip steeped in symbolism, the head of the Catholic Church was greeted by the first Indigenous Governor General, Mary Simon drawing on her Inuit heritage to deliver this message. Who worked, waited and prayed for an apology on Indigenous lands in Canada. They never gave up. We must remember that it is because of their courage and resilience that we are here today. Francis again apologized to Indigenous peoples, carefully blaming the horrors of residential schools on governments and local Catholic institutions, not the church itself. I express my deep shame and sorrow, and together with the bishops of this country, I renew my request for forgiveness for the wrong done by so many Christians to the Indigenous peoples. Thank you. Merci. Some here still hope Francis will deliver a broader apology before leaving Quebec. Like Frédéric Flamand from the Atikamekw community of Manawan. His mother survived residential school and carried the burden her whole life. I'm coming here for my mother. The problem, it was in, in her heart. With his speech shown on giant screens, Francis acknowledged the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which demanded not only he come to apologize, but that the Church and Ottawa renounce papal decrees that led to colonization. Neither the Pope nor the Prime Minister made any promise on that. Let us continue our work together with Indigenous peoples until we reach a better future. 
for everyone. As Francis made his exit, he greeted crowds in his Pope mobile, leaving some with smiles, others with expectations unfulfilled. Okay, so Thomas, a lot of people obviously paying very close attention to every single word that the Pope says. Was the message any different today? Well, I was speaking to people as they were leaving the Plains of Abraham this evening after listening to the Pope's speech. It was delivered in Spanish with subtitles in English and French here. And some people said they had to go home to look over the text of the apology to see if there was any change from what he said Monday in Musquachis. But what the former uh, National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, Phil Fontaine, is pointing out this evening is that previously, um, the Pope pointed to individual Christians as being right. behind uh, the horrors of residential schools, but today he pointed to local Catholic institutions. And what Fit Phil Fontaine says is since the Catholic Church in Canada is several institutions, this could be the closest the Pope may come to apologizing on behalf of the mm -hmm. Church in Canada. Okay, interesting interpretation. Thomas, thank you very much. You're welcome. Now, as the Pope continues his pilgrimage of penance, a group of indigenous people in northern Quebec organized its own, a week-long trek that ended today after gathering followers along the way. <laughs> that was their exuberant arrival at the Plains of Abraham. J'ai marché beaucoup aussi. A march that grew since last Thursday. That's when people from five different First Nations, including about a dozen survivors, set out from an Innu community about 260 kilometers from here. It was the site of Pointe Bleue, Quebec's last residential school, which closed in 1991. That's what they're walking away from. <laughs> last night, the ranks were bolstered when they were greeted with a solidarity march in Huron-Wendat territory in Wendake. Still ahead, my conversation with the man behind the walk. Tell me, how are you feeling right now? Really excited. A bit later in the program, the meaning for him of all those steps. And of course, a lot of this is hard to hear, hard to confront. For anyone affected by residential schools and in need of support, there is a 24-hour line. You can call the number right there on your screen, 1-866-925-4419. Now, along with all those difficult emotions, there is mixed reaction as much of this plays out on the world stage. Julia Wong shows us the range of responses after Honorary Chief Wilton Littlechild, a residential school survivor, gifted a headdress to the Pope on Monday. For many, the moment was unexpected, coming just after the Pope's apology. Honorary Chief Wilton Littlechild, a former Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner, approached the pontiff and placed a headdress on his head. Later that same day... No, it's been 500 years since the settlers arrived. An elder from Muscochese explained it was a ceremonial gift. It is giving up the uh, headdress is uh, honoring a man as the uh, honorary chief and leader in a community. And so in doing that, he's actually adopted him into as one of our leaders in the community. The images made front pages around the world, including the Vatican newspaper. But as with the apology itself, there's a range of opinions about the deep meaning the act signified. I don't agree with giving a headdress to the Pope. That those things, they, they have to stop. I have to stop that. Headdresses are gifted to First Nations leaders, and what they do with them is bound by protocol. He went to the elders, he went to the leadership, and requested permission to present that gift. This advocate's grandparents attended residential schools. He was angered by the gift. Literally, it physically made me sick. If the Catholic Church isn't willing to honor our most sacred gifts, which are our children, are they going to honor that headdress? Why? Why would you go crown them with a headdress when our people are still, you know, being found, still recovering and trying to find a way out? Little child's grandson came to his defense on social media, saying that was him showing the Pope respect for coming all the way to Musquachese to apologize. A conversation that, like the trip itself, continues to stir up complex feelings. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. Now this trip, this moment continues to evoke a lot of emotions 
will be here to bear witness during these historic moments. And we will have more from here in Quebec City in just a moment. But for now, let's get things over to you, Neil, for more of the news of the day. Thanks so much, Andrew. And once again, Hockey Canada is where we begin. In testimony today before a House of Commons committee, the organization says it has paid out more than 20 settlements over allegations of sexual assault. And as Ashley Burke shows us, it is just the latest revelation, putting its leaders on the defensive. And we do want to warn you, this story contains some disturbing details. The head of an organization in crisis fighting to save his job. Canadians have been clear. They expect those representing our national sport to do better. We own it and we will do better. Hockey Canada is under intense scrutiny for its handling of a group sexual assault allegation in 2018. MPs say it's time for change at the top. Why is it now in this moment that you think Canadians should trust you and Hockey Canada and senior management? There needs to be new leadership within Hockey Canada. Will you do that? Will you step down? I do believe that I have the support of our board and our membership, and I'm, I want to be held accountable to take Hockey Canada to a better place. A woman alleges that in 2018 she was sexually assaulted, including by members of Canada's World Junior Team. In a statement of claim which has not been proven in court, she says she was visibly drunk and while engaging in sexual acts with one hockey player, he allowed seven others to enter the room without her knowledge or consent. She says they brought golf clubs with them, knowing it would further intimidate and frighten her, and alleges they later told her to say she was sober while being video recorded and to shower. The team was made up of approximately 22 players, all of whom had signed professional contracts. Players, no matter their skill, must know that they cannot act with impunity. Hockey Canada settled with the woman, agreeing to pay a maximum of $3.5 million, but it is facing criticism for using a fund partly made up of hockey registration fees. I can understand that the parents aren't happy. I wouldn't be happy uh, as well, um, but that's, that's the reality of the situation. After hearing today's testimony, the federal sports minister said Hockey Canada failed to answer key questions and is calling for major changes. The CEO, but the whole director's board, uh, they need to, to, they, it needs to be revised. Um, there's not enough diversity uh, on that table. Ashley, we do know police are investigating another case from 2003, and today we, we got a sense of just how many other allegations there have been. Hockey Canada revealed today it settled 21 sexual misconduct claims since 1989, totaling close to $9 million in compensation. And the bulk of that has been paid out using that special fund made up in part by registration fees, which Hockey Canada says it will no longer use. The rest is through insurance. And a large portion of that money was for victims of convicted sex offender Graham James, a former junior hockey coach. We learned all of this during four hours of testimony, but there are still many unanswered answered questions, including how long Hockey Canada's leadership can hold on to their jobs. Ashley Burke in Ottawa for us. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. There are three separate investigations underway tonight after a child was hit by a commuter train in Mississauga, Ontario. And I heard like a, like a screeching sound from the, from the train. I was close enough to see that the train did collide with something. The impact last night was fatal and it left witnesses reeling. I haven't I haven't slept at, at this point, right? Like I'm still like I'm still going, you know, getting through it, right? It's not clear how the child got onto those tracks, but today crews began mending gaps that had been cut in the fencing there. It made a well known shortcut across the tracks. There's no fence. So kids are gonna go down there. The child's death and the family's grief has shaken the community. And just hearing the pain um, and the cries of the family was really hard. Even I live on the 17th floor and you could just hear the screams of crying. Like, do you know how loud that has to be for it to carry that high? Like, I seen the father going back into the apartment last night. Two people were holding him up. He was just ready to collapse. Mississauga's City Hall lowered flags to half mass to honor the child's memory. Peel Regional Police, Canadian Pacific Railway, and the Transportation Safety Board are all investigating. 
Many people in British Columbia are sweltering again tonight. Most of the province is still under a heat warning, but temperatures there are expected to peak soon. Last summer, hundreds of people died because of the extreme heat. But as Lindsay Duncombe shows us, this year's response is different. In a city of glass, windows need to be installed no matter the heat. I'm replacing windows 20 floors up right now. What is that like in the heat? It's, it's no fun. You're just, you're, even in the times you're standing there, you're still just dripping sweat. Misting stations help. That's nice. <laughs> Signs of a city and a province adapting. There is increased awareness here. Heat can kill. More than 600 people died in last year's heat dome. This week's heat wave is not expected to be as intense, but it is expected to persist through early next week. Day over day and night after night, we're building temperatures under this uh, essentially cloudless sky uh, for most of BC, the whole southern two thirds essentially. In Vancouver, that heat is trapping ozone and reducing air quality. Most here don't have air conditioning. Cracking a window only does so much. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> it is very hot. Like, even if you open all the windows, and I do have a lot of windows, it is just too hot. And it's even hotter to the west. Parts of the interior could reach 40 degrees. Stay hydrated. Thank you so much. Volunteer efforts have urgency. What's your worst fear? Whisper, people dying because of the heat, and we didn't reach them. Special efforts are being made to reach out to people living on the street. With the heat, it just compounds everything else. So what you have is you have individuals who are already dealing with many challenges in, in their lives, and now you have the climate emergency attached to it on top of it. Everyone is being asked to check on the vulnerable, older people, those living alone. BC, it seems, can no longer bask in the sunshine without acknowledging the danger. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. Two men have now been charged in B.C. in the murder of Raputaman Singh Malik. He was acquitted in the 1985 Air India bombings. 21-year-old Tanner Fox is charged with first-degree murder, as is 23-year-old Jose Lopez. I, I feel mixed emotions. I mean, everybody in our family is feeling, you know, it's, this is not the end. This is a step in the process. Um, this still doesn't answer the why. Malik was gunned down outside his family business on July 14th. The Public Health Agency of Canada's latest data on monkeypox in this country shows it is still spreading. There are now 745 cases in Canada. That's up 10% over the past four days. Almost all of those cases are in Quebec, Ontario and B.C., Globally, the World Health Organization counts more than 18,000 cases in 78 countries. At this point, these outbreaks are not just going to go away. And as Lauren Pelly explains, there are concerns the public health messaging so far may be missing the mark. The growing global outbreak of monkeypox is still overwhelmingly impacting men who have sex with men. Recent research published in the New England Journal of Medicine looked at worldwide infections between April and June. The team found 98% of those infected were gay or bisexual men. In 95% of those cases, the virus likely spread through sexual activity. It's just the way in which we are seeing most of the transmission at this time. One of the authors behind the study says symptoms can include lesions or more subtle warning signs. We have had a number of cases present with a sore throat or with rectal pain. Today, a request from officials in Canada and beyond. The Public Health Agency of Canada recommends practicing safer sex. For men who have sex with men, this includes, for the moment, reducing your number of sexual partners, reconsidering sex with new partners, and exchanging contact details. It's a message that's raising eyebrows among members of Canada's gay and bisexual communities as advocacy work is underway and eligible men are trying to access a limited supply of vaccines. I just want to be precautious and, and not get it. It's a, horrible, it's a horrible thing to get. It's painful. I think what's not helpful is, is uh, uh, where public health is you know, pushing these messages that, is, that are not 
recognizing um, the efforts and initiative taken by the community uh, for prevention. That should be the focus, says this advocate, since isolation periods can last for weeks. We definitely need to see a greater emphasis on providing supports for people who are getting monkeypox. You know, and that can include everything from income and housing supports. This virus can infect anyone. The concern now is what happens if it's not contained, spreading monkeypox into more countries and more communities. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. At least five people are dead and dozens of others injured in the Philippines after a powerful 7.0 magnitude earthquake overnight. This is newly released drone footage and you can see just how extensive the damage is north of Manila. Buildings destroyed, cars crushed by the debris. People there are also dealing with landslides now and more than 200 aftershocks that have been recorded since the earthquake hit. The United States says it's made an offer to Russia to bring detained American citizens home. As Breyer Stewart shows us, while loved ones are hopeful, some experts warn about making deals with Moscow. Brittany Griner is a U.S. basketball star and observers say also a political pawn. She's on trial for bringing cannabis oil into Russia when she flew there in February. Griner testified she was using it to help treat injuries and she mistakenly packed it. I do plead guilty because of the actions that have happened, but I, again, did not intend to do this. She could be sentenced to years in prison unless her release is negotiated. In the coming days, I expect to speak with Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov for the first time since the war began. I plan to raise an issue that's a top priority for us, the release of Americans Paul Whelan and Brittany Griner. Paul Whelan is a former Marine who also holds Canadian citizenship. He was convicted of espionage and has been in custody since 2018. The U.S. says it made a substantial offer to Russia a few weeks ago, but so far no response. Whelan's family say they hope a deal is made, and quickly. It's corrosive. He's lost about 20% of the weight he had when he was first arrested back in 2018. Um, we don't really know what his health uh, situation is like. Uh, he's not able to see a doctor or get regular medical care. U.S. officials won't elaborate on the offer, but CNN is reporting that they want Griner and Whelan to be exchanged for a Russian arms dealer named Victor Boot. Boot was once called the merchant of death and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Political observers say Boot is notorious and there's a risk of carrying out this kind of exchange. It teaches states like Russia, like China, Iran, Venezuela, that all they have to do is arrest a foreigner on these egregious trumped up charges and eventually they'll be able to negotiate their way out. But at the same time, the U.S. wants to show it's doing everything it can to free those who they say are wrongfully imprisoned abroad. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Toronto. U.S. gun makers were under intense scrutiny today, not just about the deadly weapons they sell, but the tactics they use to market them. Any rational person can see the direct lines from this marketing to the troubled young men. Coming up, the dramatic testimony in Washington, plus a little later, one of Canada's biggest musical stars cancels his tour. Please have mercy on me. Sean Mendez is putting his mental health first, what it could mean to others. And I'll be back from Quebec City with more on the Pope's historic visit, including those who have walked hundreds of kilometers to have their voices heard. The apology, it's, it's one step. Now we want concrete action. Up next, the hope and hurt among those gathering in Quebec. We're back in two. Welcome back to Quebec City tonight. The Plains of Abraham just behind me. Today, this was a gathering place where people flocked to hear Pope Francis speak. He arrived in the province this afternoon and met with the Governor General and Prime Minister. This is the second leg of his trip where he'll stay until Friday. Now, we spent a lot of time talking about the Pope's pilgrimage, one of penance. But 
equally, if not more important, are the pilgrimages of thousands across Quebec to be here, each with their own hopes, demands, and disappointments. As I found out, there is a lot riding on this leg of his trip and what he might say tomorrow when he delivers mass. It's hard to describe what it feels like to be here in this place at this moment. We are at the Saint Anne de Beaupré Basilica, a shrine to the woman known in Christianity as being the mother of Mary, grandmother of Jesus. But it's just across the road where you will find a campsite of hundreds, maybe even thousands of people who have made the pilgrimage here. And despite being so close to the Basilica, feel like they're being left out. Parce que comme si c'était à, à vous d'avoir le choix d'être là-dedans demain ou, ou ben mais je le dis vous serez là. On aimerait ça. Ben oui, c'est sûr, c'est sûr, c'est sûr, sûr qu'on veut, c'est sûr notre souhait d'être prendre. They are Inu chiefs and elders from Quebec's north, hesitant to talk, unsure how close to the Pope they can get. I'm told at first, no interviews, but that changes quickly on the subject of memories that they can never forget, even if they try. Chacun, on avait un numéro, chacun. Elle aussi, ma soeur aussi, elle aussi, tout, on avait un numéro, un cosy pour mettre le neige, toutes nos affaires. Ben, il nous linge en arrière, on a, a porté des numéros. Et vous vous souvenez ces numéros? Ben oui, certain, certain. Il a resté ici, là. Il a resté, il va rester tout le temps ici. Et même ici, si je meurs, il va rester encore. One way or another, whether in person or over a loudspeaker, Marie-Marc Régis says she will listen to what the Pope has to say. But there's only one thing she wants to hear. Mais les mots... C'est ça le plus important pour moi. Le peuple qui dit, je m'excuse au nom de la religion, toute la religion. C'est ça, c'est ça que je vais attendre, moi. Many roads to reconciliation will converge here tomorrow, but like most journeys in life, not everybody follows the same path. We're working for our survival. Uh, I want to let go this anger of what happened to my nation, to those children, to my father. This march, small but powerful. They've been walking for days, covered 260 kilometers, starting at a former residential school up north. One of the only events of this papal visit organized by and for indigenous people from start to finish. By evening, they arrive in Wendaki, not far from the heart of Quebec City, tantalizingly close to their final destination. How are you feeling right now? Really excited. Yeah. It's been a long journey, but we're very really proud. This is Jay Lonier Mathias. He's organized this walk. And just look at their feet, in their own way, defiant. Almost uh, 500 years after colonization, we are still here. When I was walking, I was really thinking of. I was thinking of, of my grandmother, and she's here. She she walked with us today. What did she tell you? Well, she she's still in her healing process. It's not easy for for her. She was kind of angry, but she was also really proud. So that that's a mix of emotions. Turns out, it's a very familiar mix in this crowd. But the price of slowing the pace, giving up the demand of the Pope for justice? It's not the end. And the excuses that he, he made, it's, it's one step. The apology. Yeah, the, the apology. It's, it's one step. Now we want concrete action. Is, is it in you to forgive everything that's happened? I think it's important. I think it's um, it's important to forgive, but it's also important to remember. Yeah. Fortunately, here in Huron-Wendat territory, even on the loneliest of walks, there is company. Same goes back at the campground on territory that has, over the years, drawn millions. Those who've come filled with hope alongside those with scars that run deep. Est-ce que c'est encore possible de 
te guérir, selon vous? Non. Pour moi, jamais. Il va rester tout le temps dans mon cœur. Jusqu'à ma mort, je vais le porter. There is so much hurt, paired with so much hope, but, you know, again and again, what I heard from survivors is that healing comes through action. And what they've seen so far on the Pope's trip, simply not enough. Now, Pope Francis will be here in Quebec for another day and a half. Tomorrow morning, he will hold a holy mass at the National Shrine of Saint Anne de Beaupré. Special coverage begins at 9 a.m. Eastern Time on CBC Television and CBC News Network. I'll be with you for that and back for the National tomorrow night from here in Quebec City. And on Friday, Adrian will be hosting from Iqaluit, where Pope Francis is heading next. So still a lot to come in this papal visit. But for tonight, Neil, we will send it back to you in Toronto. We'll certainly be watching. Thanks so much, Andrew. An emotional apology from a top Mountie at Nova Scotia's Mass Casualty Commission and a response from families of the victims. It was the first time in two and a half years that we've heard from anybody, you know, say they're sorry. That is coming up for you. Plus, this advertisement you're showing is, is a safety advertisement. Is it appropriate? About... It's a yes or no question. U.S. gun makers face tough questions about the way they market deadly weapons. I've uh, just tested negative for COVID-19 after isolating for five days. U.S. President Joe Biden says he's feeling great after recovering from COVID and will now be able to return to work in person. The U.S. president tested positive last week. He was treated with Pfizer's antiviral drug Paxlovid. The 79-year-old is fully vaccinated with two doses of Pfizer and two booster shots. Executives from U.S. gun manufacturing companies got a grilling on Capitol Hill. They are facing accusations that it is not only their products fueling America's crisis of gun violence, but their marketing too. And as Katie Simpson shows us, lawmakers are not the only ones demanding answers. Lawmakers forced gun industry executives to face the raw pain caused by mass shootings. Ten years ago, I soliciting questions for this hearing from survivors and victims' families. What are you going to do? It's okay. To make sure that your products don't get into the hands of a white supremacist mass shooter. Over the course of five hours, leaders of two major gun companies defended the sale of assault-style weapons, which has earned the industry more than a billion dollars over the past decade. We firmly believe that it is wrong to deprive citizens of their constitutional right to purchase the lawful firearm they desire because of the criminal acts of wicked people. I believe that these murders are local problems. So why Daniel Defense? Their marketing practices faced some of the harshest scrutiny. Any rational person can see the direct lines from this marketing to the troubled young men who kill people in places like Buffalo and El Paso and Uvalde. A former insider accused gun companies of exploiting insecure young men and appealing to domestic terror groups, though executives stood by their practices. Daniel Defense specifically defended this, a photo of a toddler cradling a gun with the proverb, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This advertisement you're showing is, is a safety advertisement. Is it appropriate? About, it's a yes or no question. This, this advertisement Reclaiming is about my safety. time. But the gun companies had plenty of defense from Republicans. The partisan divide this on full like display. Saying that we're going to blame the manufacturers of forks and spoons for obesity. Gun manufacturers do not cause violent crime. Criminals cause violent crime. Democrats want to ban assault-style weapons, but they don't have the votes to get it through Congress. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Quebec's police watchdog is investigating after a deadly shooting overnight. An RCMP officer was killed. That officer was killed by police after allegedly injuring a woman and a teenager inside his home south of Montreal. Two people are in hospital with serious injuries. Well, more than two years after 22 people were killed by a gunman, families of the victims heard an apology from a senior Mountie. Catherine Tunney brings us that emotional moment 
and the reaction. I want to express my sincere um, condolences and... Uh, a moment of atonement, more than two years in the making, from one of Nova Scotia's head Mounties at the time of the shooting in 2020. I, I apologize for failing. I haven't cried for two and a half years. That apology to families of the 22 victims came at the tail end of two days of testimony, where Chief Superintendent Darren Campbell expressed regret for some of the actions of the RCMP that weekend. I'm truly sorry that we failed you. I promise that we'll do better. Ryan Farrington was listening. His mother and stepfather were among the victims. So moved by Campbell's words, Farrington tracked the Mountie down to thank him. And it was the first time in two and a half years that we've heard from anybody, you know, say they're sorry and, and take responsibility. Forgiveness for one man, but not the RCMP as a whole. I forgive Mr. Campbell. As for the RCMP, I still think there needs to be work. They need to show that changes are being made. You know, I'll say it right now, obviously, uh, I missed the mark on more than a couple occasions. Another senior Mountie was under scrutiny today about some of the first communications to the public, including early descriptions of the situation as a firearms complaint when police knew there was an active shooter. Leather admitted today the information early on was lacking, but he said he never meant to intentionally mislead the public. He'll face more questioning when he returns tomorrow. Catherine Tunney, CBC News, Halifax. As Canada's housing market takes a dip, some sellers are feeling a bit let down. We figure we lost about $150,000. Plus... Sean Mendez is cancelling his world tour and says he is putting his mental health first. So I'm just The U.S. Central Bank has taken another aggressive step to fight inflation with another major hike of its benchmark interest rates. The current picture is plain to see. The labor market is extremely tight and inflation is much too high. The chair of the U.S. Federal Reserve there explaining why he's increased the rate by another 75 basis points. It comes after U.S. inflation topped 9 percent last month. That is a 40-year high. Well, here in Canada, the rising cost of borrowing appears to be having an impact on the housing market. Across this country, sales are slowing, prices are dipping, and as Alexander Bena reports, that's leaving some sellers disappointed. It's moving day for the Hawkins family. But like many Canadians who've sold their homes in the last few months, they got less than they hoped. We figure we lost about $150,000. I know we didn't lose it because it was not ours, right? But to not earn as much as other people have earned three weeks earlier. The family had put a deposit down on a new build home. And it looked like our, that's our forever home. And just the way that the market was, we could sell this house for maybe not too much of a difference to get to the new house price. That was our expectation. But the market had other ideas. The average price of a home in June was $665,000, down more than $150,000 from the all-time high in February 2022. So things went up too far, they went up too fast, and it was inevitable we would see the pendulum swing back. And here we are. The shift is even being felt in Canada's priciest housing market. The last few months we've started to see some decline in home prices. But this swing may not have much impact on access to housing. Prices may be falling, but the cost of borrowing is going up. We still are faced with tremendous lack of affordability prior to these uh, interest rate hikes because we simply don't have enough housing and affordable housing uh, for the people that live here. And the big part of the story is at the bottom end of the market. The Hawkins know they're fortunate to be in the market at all. If we didn't already own a home, we, we, would not have, we would not have been able to afford that. We're, you know, lucky. 
For those who missed the market peak, watching prices plummet will be a bitter pill to swallow. As experts warn, interest rates will continue to rise and prices have much further to fall. Alexander Baina, CBC News, Ottawa. Sean Mendez has cancelled his world tour. Please have mercy on me. Take it easy on my heart. Coming up, his decision to prioritize his mental health and the support he's getting from fans and advocates. After performing seven shows, including this one earlier this month in Edmonton, Canadian pop star Shawn Mendes is cancelling the rest of his world tour, more than 70 performances, to focus, he says, on his mental health. Mendes postponed his tour earlier this month, but in a statement today, he says he needs more time away. As Philip Lishanek shows us, fans are disappointed but still applauding the move to let his own mental health take center stage. Toronto fans took the news that Sean Mendes won't be playing for a hometown crowd hard. I was actually devastated. On social media, Mendes said the decision was made with his tour team, including those looking after his health, writing, it's become more clear that I need to take time to ground myself and come back stronger. Anyone can empathize with the feeling of letting someone down, and I can only imagine how acutely that was felt by Shawn Mendes, and I think it just struck me as so courageous. Help me. It's not the first time the 23-year-old has opened up about his mental health. Sometimes I feel like giving up. In 2018, he released a song about his experience with anxiety. He later spoke about it with Tom Power, host of Q on CBC Radio 1. The only way progression is going to happen is by talking about it and by allowing people to, everybody to talk about it, you know. Um, it just becomes more of a normal thing. Mendez is the latest young star standing up to say they need a break from the pressure. I'm, I'm thinking about when Simone Biles spoke about her challenges with mental health and how that was applauded and celebrated in the sports community. This professional musician whose PhD is on anxiety and performing agrees that much like athletes, musicians work in a hyper-competitive world. They got where they are because they are perfectionists. Musicians can be very, very hard on themselves after a concert. This fan says while he can't see him perform live, his example will help others. And I wish I had people like Shawn Mendes before to sort of like give me that example for me to feel more comfortable about me speaking up about it. Philip Lee Shadok, CBC News, Toronto. Oysters are pretty popular in Nova Scotia, but this year, one in particular is getting a lot of attention. Pearl definitely stands out in the crowd. Yeah, Pearl is all eyes, legs, and lips. We'll explain next in our moment. Well, welcome back. This, what, what you're seeing there, is Pearl, the unforgettable face of the Halifax Oyster Festival. And now, of course, Pearl is internet famous. Some have used the word terrifying. Others say they're mesmerized. Either way, this mascot and the attention she's getting makes our moment. I could never describe that, what we were thinking. It didn't feel like a cute and cuddly kind of event. She just fits the vibe of the festival. We have not stopped laughing for three days now. People are sharing other mascots from other festivals of oysters, and a lot of them are sweet and soft and round. So Pearl definitely stands out in the crowd. You know, there's something about oysters that not everyone enjoys. Early days, it would be my daughter, her friends, who we would wrestle into the costume. Now we have people who are signing up on our volunteer sign-up intake form to be the mascot, which is great. <laughs> I'm not sure why the joy around it or terrifying joy is around it, but somehow that, that, that fire that can be Twitter in, the, in a positive way uh, really elevated her to the world stage. She's beautiful. I know what everybody's worried about. You can find out more about Pearl, though, and her companion. You saw... 
that companion Earl. Yeah, she has one in the photos. Uh, from our colleagues, you'll find out more at As It Happens. That's at cbc.ca slash AIH. That, though, is the national for you on this July 27th. I'm Nika Oksal. Good night.